first of all, maybe, I don't know who wants to take this question, but maybe you could summarize some of the really key issues. Now, one thing I didn't know, for example, was uh, Yates' involvement in the Indiana, Indiana Dunes. I always think of Paul Douglas as the third uh, Indiana senator who <laughs> saved the dunes, but it turns out that Sidney Yates had a big part of that. Well, first up, I want to thank Midland Authors for, for having George and me, and uh, I want to give a couple of special thanks to, to Greg Borzo, who um, gave us, as we were going through this, uh, lots and lots of practical information, and then uh, particularly to, to Dick Simpson, um, with, without whom the book would, would, would uh, certainly if, wouldn't have been published as quickly as it got published, and we really want to thank Dick Simpson tremendously for all the encouragement that he gave us, uh, both in, in terms of the writing as well as with the University of Illinois Press. Uh, this was the Sid Yates who, who they, they, they named a federal building for in Washington. They named a gallery for here in the, uh, at the Chicago Cultural Center. Uh, and George and I thought we, we knew who this person was. And uh, uh, George and I, in fact, um, we, we, we got to know each other, George, in Chicago and Washington because um, Congressman Yates never told everybody all the story. He compartmentalized uh, as his management style. And so uh, <coughs> at, at the end of the day, George and I got into this habit of we, we'd have this phone call from Washington to Chicago and back where uh, I'd say to George, okay, uh, this is what the Congressman said to me today. And George would say, well, he didn't tell me that, but he, these are the things he told me. And we would try to put the story together and, and, and thought we, we, we knew him. And, and so we knew him as the environmentalist, as the champion of the arts, um, as the person who was just respected by everybody. And it really wasn't until we started writing the book that we, we, we learned about all the other, the, the other issues. Uh, the, the, the congressman who has, has, has um, uh, Tom mentioned, uh, saved the, uh, the Navy's nuclear propulsion program because he saved the career of uh, Hyman Rickover, who was uh, a Navy captain who was in charge of that program and was about to be uh, cashiered out of the Navy. Uh, and Sid Yates saved him. And uh, Hyman Rickover writes him a letter and says, you know, uh, when they built the Nautilus, the first uh, nuclear submarine, that uh, you were as responsible for this submarine as any engineer, any naval officer in the, in the United States. Uh, we learned about the Sid Yates who uh, stopped the SST from being uh, <coughs> uh, brought into the United States because it was so environmentally unsound, who stopped the anti-ballistic system, uh, anti-ballistic missile system from being, from being built because it was, it was a boondoggle that was going to upset the, the whole balance of power. And, and, and the Sid Yates, who, who's probably the biggest champion of, of, of Israel and of, and of uh, Jewish, Jewish issues. And in fact, the, uh, the title of our book, Clear It with Sid, uh, comes from uh, a story we were told that when uh, members of Congress came to Speaker Tip O'Neill uh, to ask uh, Tip if, they, if, if Tip would support uh, legislation that might involve the Middle East, might involve uh, other issues around that nature, uh, Tip O'Neill would say to that member of Congress, well, you better clear it with Sid first. And, and if Sid Yates says it's okay, then, then, then come back to me. So there are all these issues that we, we didn't really recognize until we started, started researching it and found a much, much deeper person than the person that, that we knew, not only in, in the substantive issues, but also in, in the individual. Would you like to add to that? Well, uh, his growth, I think, probably came in 1962. Uh, he ran for the United States Senate against a fairly popular incumbent, the uh, Senate Minority Leader, Everett Dirksen. He thought he would have the support of the President, John Kennedy. He and Kennedy were on good personal terms. Uh, Kennedy came to the House of Representatives in 46, Yates in 48. But on Tuesday evenings, a couple times a month, a lot of the former veterans got together for dinner. And Kennedy and Yates knew each other and got along very well. In 52, Kennedy ran for the Senate in Massachusetts 
against a longtime Massachusetts Brahmin. Very difficult race. Got in touch with Yates and said, I'm, I'm down. Uh, I'm having a very difficult time with the Jews. Uh, they don't like my father. And the old man was, in fact, anti-Semitic and in the early years had been a, a Nazi supporter. Would you come out and help me? And Yates did. Yates helped him. And then, as time moved on, 1960, Yates thinks this is going to be his year. Uh, Kennedy gets elected president. Yates campaigns all throughout Illinois. Uh, he and Paul Douglas did a lot of campaigning together. And he was expecting an appropriation subcommittee chairmanship. He was in line for it. The chairman of the committee did not like Yates. Uh, that's putting it mildly. To say he despised Yates would be more accurate. He, yeah, he was anti-Semitic. He also didn't like Yates because he was a liberal. So he eliminated the subcommittee. And here Yates has been building up all of this seniority, so he decides he's going to run for the US Senate difficult race. Kennedy doesn't support him. Um, long, long story. But in the end, Kennedy stabbed Yates in the back. He wanted Dirksen reelected because he feared who would be Dirksen's successor if Yates was successful. And Yates left the House. He was defeated went to the United Nations with his old, very close friend, Adlai Stevenson. Uh, the two people who always stuck with Yates throughout his career was Paul Douglas, U.S. Senate, and Adlai Stevenson. Uh, came back, ran in 64, and retrieved his seat in the House. But he was a different person. Uh, he was still liberal. He was still idealistic, but now he was much more pragmatic. Uh, if you wanted something from Yates, he wanted something from you. Uh, much more of a politician than he had been before, and not as trusting uh, as he had been. And I think he used this growth uh, as a way to forge a lot of bipartisan coalitions. Uh, one of the things we try to bring out in the book is how Yates worked with Republicans. And I'll just end with this small story. Uh, Yates was on the floor of the House. He had proposed an amendment dealing with those I recall, I think it was toxaphene. Uh, he wanted it banned and the EPA and the uh, National Health Service were very slow. Uh, and one of the members, uh, Congressman Conobel of uh, Massachusetts, got up and said, I don't know anything about this. I'm not a scientist. But what I do know are two things. One, if Yates is proposing an amendment, he's studied it, he knows he knows that I've got confidence in him. But secondly, I admire Sid Yates, and I'm asking my Republican colleagues to please support this amendment. And that's just an example of the kind of uh, politician he became. So while we're on the topic of the uh, politics, it wasn't just Kennedy who turned out not to <laughs> be trustworthy from Yates' point of view. But other people, Mayor Daley, uh, Lyndon Johnson, yeah. maybe you could talk a little well, bit about that. Certainly, the, uh, Lyndon Johnson, ap absolutely. And, and one, one of the things which is so terrible about um, the, um, the, the, current, the current administration, just from a, a, a researcher point of view, I'm not even getting into the politics, but we were able to go into presidential libraries of, of, of Johnson, of, of Ford, of, of Eisenhower, of, of, of Reagan, Bush, all of the presidents 
that, 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 that Yates dealt with. And there, there were detailed, there, there are detailed visitor logs, there are, there are re re recordings, there are all the things that we were able to use to find out how frequently presidents uh, consulted Sid Yates. And, and it's really unfortunate the current administration has, uh, doesn't, doesn't issue visitor logs anymore because researchers, writers really lose a, a tremendous resource. And one of the things we found in the, in the Johnson Library uh, and also at the U University of uh, Virginia's uh, presidential Miller Presidential Center are uh, Lyndon Johnson's White House tapes. Uh, and and we, f we found what we always thought was the, one of the smoking guns, a, uh, a tape between, well, after Johnson became president between Johnson and uh, Everett Dirksen, uh, where, where Johnson is saying to Dirksen, and you know, uh, I, I saved you in 1962. The, uh, the White House came to me and said, should we be supporting Sid Yates? And I said to them, it will be a sad day in history that they, that Ever Ev Dirksen isn't in the Senate. Uh, so we, we know Lyndon Johnson worked, worked against Yates. Um, Daly is the only <laughs> place where George and I had a substantive disagreement. Um, I am absolutely convinced that, 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 that Daly worked against Sid Yates. And, and um, his, uh, um, Mr. Yates' chief of staff, I have to still call him Mr. Yates. Uh, Mr. Yates' chief of staff, Mary Bain, uh, told us <coughs> that uh, on the last weekend of the, of the election, um, uh, Yates asked Mayor Daley, should I go downstate and campaign and try to shore up some downstate counties or uh, should I stay up here? And Mayor Daley says to, to Yates, you, you go downstate, I'll take care of Cook County for you. And certainly Mary Bain to her dying day believed that, that, that uh, Dick, Dick Daley uh, deliberately held back votes uh, from Sid Yates. Now, George has, as a George disagrees, um, so we we, um, we we couched it in, in in the book. It's not as as absolute a fact as as the fact we know about Kennedy, the facts we know about Johnson, but um, I know Dick Daly <laughs> screwed so, Sid Yates. So you were you the one who <laughs> put in the line about the River Wars? Then? <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Well, can you explain that? Well, facts are a funny little thing. <laughs> um, if you were to go back and look at the election results, and that's really what it's all about. And you, you go <coughs> along the river wards, those were the wards where Daly really had control. He, could, he, could, he had room to maneuver in those 10 wards, of, if I remember right, it's 10 wards. And uh, we went through the results for all 10 wards, not just for Yates and Dirksen, but for all of the candidates, county, aldermen, et cetera. And Yates either won or came very close to being the top vote getter in all those wards. Uh, and it, it's hard to believe that Daly would have sacrificed uh, his county board, uh, his aldermen, and people like that just to uh, stab Yates in the back. And I say it, you don't look at, you're looking at the wrong numbers. You're, you, don't, you don't look at just whether, whether the person led the field. You have to look at what was the number that, that could have been it. What was the, what was the margin of the vote? Um, and I, I, I think you know, the, the fact that everybody else won and Yates led the ticket doesn't mean anything unless you looked at where the, the that the total vote could have could have been, um, but we 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 have never resolved this. Um, it may be a while before before we ever do. My feeling is Mike has every right to be wrong. <laughs> so each of you will have to read the book so you can form your own opinion. <laughs> so I'd like to maybe put this because I'm curious about this in sort of a uh, current context. How would somebody like Sid Yates function? in today's atmosphere in Washington? <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And <clears throat> Sid, Sid Yates believed in, in bipartisanship. He, 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 be, he believed that just because somebody was your opponent on an issue that didn't make them uh, your enemy. And, and we've, we've been, you know, people have said to us, you know, aren't you naive today to think that, that something like this can happen? 
and we, we've, we've put in some suggestions about that. Um, c c congressmen don't socialize anymore, and, and, and it's almost uh, so basic, so, you know, why, why aren't these kids playing together? But um, we would like to get rid of the Tuesday-Thursday club, for instance, where, where members of Congress, uh, they hold all, all the votes until Tuesday, so members of Congress come in on Tuesday, they, they leave on Thursday, they go back to their district, and they never know each other. And, and it's even worse these days because a lot of members of Congress are, are living in their offices, um, which to, to me is disgusting, not only from a, a, a hygiene standpoint, but, but also because, come on, you're, you're getting enough money as a congressman, you can, you, can, you can rent an apartment in Washington with a couple of other, other members. They don't know each other, uh, they, they don't deal with, other, with, with each other, and if you get to know somebody as a person, you can go into a conference committee, you can, you can go into a negotiation, and, and you, can, uh, you, can, you can respect them. And th that's totally gone. So we'd like to get rid of that. Um, we, we'd also like to bring back earmarks. Um, as earmarks, earmarks greased the wheels, earmarks created some, some discipline, and earmarks gave members of Congress a, um, a reason to compromise with other members of Congress. Log rolling and trading is not a bad thing, and, and, it, and it creates a functioning legislature in, instead of this, this tribalism that's going on where, uh, where, where, where compromise is a dirty word. Well, and the members uh, of a lot of the delegations, particularly <coughs> Illinois, they all met once a month. They had lunch together, and got to know each other. Democrats and Republicans sat together. They talked, traded rumors and stories and things like that. Um, how many of you have ever been the victim of flooding? No, nope. fortunately, okay, a couple people. Fortunately, not, not many of you. Part of that is because of some log rolling or earmarking that was done. Uh, the head of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District met with the Illinois delegation at one of these luncheons, pitched them on this crazy idea of what we call deep tunnel today, uh, an, an engineering phenomenon. And part of it was purify water. The other part was to capture and retain water to stop flooding all of the Areas, particularly the north and northwestern suburbs, had terrible flooding problems. Uh, so after a couple meetings and discussing it, the delegation decided we're going to support the Water Reclamation District. And we've got to get money in one of the bills, the Public Works Bill, to provide for the preliminary engineering of the project. So they turned to Yates and said, well, you're in charge of that. You're on the Appropriations Committee. You've got to do it. He turned to one of his Republican colleagues and said, you've got to go to Reagan. This was during the uh, Ronald Reagan administration. And get him to promise he'll sign the bill. Uh, I don't want him vetoing the bill and accusing us of tax and spend. So uh, the Republican member says, I agree, I'll take care of it. A Couple of days later, he calls Yates, says, I talked to the president, he will sign the bill. We gotta get it to him, he can't help us as far as getting it to him, he'll sign the bill. Yates then asked, what about David Stockman? Some of you who remember the Reagan era will remember Stockman, uh, Mr. Balance the Budget, let's take a meat ax to all the programs. And Reagan's response was, I'll take care of Stockman. You just get the bill to me. Well, they did. And as a result of that, Deep Tunnel came about, and it has saved billions of dollars as well as a certain amount of heartache. Uh, there's nothing like waking up in the middle of the night and going downstairs and seeing six inches or a foot of water in your basement um, and, but that was part of members getting together and ironing out differences. 
Uh, we can't get back to it. Uh, it's going to require the people have to turn out our current administration. And secondly, they have to make it known to their members, Democrats and Republicans, liberal and conservatives, get something done for, for the people. Um, and I think that's what the next election is all about. Okay, so we're about halfway through the program, so let's check and see if people in the audience have any questions. Anything? One of the questions that came up in the district at the time was, did Sid stay too long? A, a term too long. Uh, Maybe you can explain, George, because most people don't know. He was in uh, from 1948, with the exception of 64, 65, uh, when, when he returned to the House. Uh, and he served until the election of 1998. So he was there a long time. Uh, he was older. He was, uh, I think he was 91, is that right? When he, he, he was uh, 89 when he, when he 89. left. 89. Um, so he was getting up there. And I, I, looking back on it, I think that last term, he, he was starting to physically have problems. Uh, I remember the, la when I, the last time I saw him at the office, we were closing up and he looked good. Um, and then there was a function, they were honoring him over at, uh, at what do you call it, the Field Museum. And I, I went over for it. I was standing there waiting for him to come in to, to greet my old boss and he's in a wheelchair. Um, and he just, within six months, he had deteriorated, so. One, one, one of his great fears um, was the, there was the, the image of uh, a former Illinois congressman named Mel Price, who had, who had been chair of the, the House Armed Services Committee. And, and Mel Price, in his last couple of years, um, had to be propped up by his staff in, in order to, to, to stand up to make a vote. and and. And was an object of pity, and 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 Yates very much did did, did not want to 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 be an object of, of pity. His his mind was it was was absolutely as, as sharp as could be, but the body uh, really was wearing out. And uh, and finally, I, I think after that that last term, he, he realized he really f had had to leave at that point. He could have been reelected. I would say he could have been reelected. Okay. Is, is Jan Schakowsky a worthy successor? Yes. I yeah. think Jan is, uh, is a very good member, uh, very hardworking. Uh, I think she represents the values of the 9th Congressional District. It's a much more diverse district than it was back then. Um, and she does have a nice touch, I, I think, with, with the voters. I don't see her in Chicago as much, but I see her in the suburbs quite a bit. And Personally, I enjoy working with her. And she was, she was great to us in, in the, uh, the writing of the book. So I have a question. Uh, one of the things that struck me was at different points when the political forces tried to sideline uh, Cindy Yates, he would decide to go out and make himself an expert on various issues, and then that would keep him in the public eye and keep him an important functioning member of Congress. But of course, it took a lot of time. With all the time that today's members of Congress have to devote, especially in the House, to fundraising, is that still possible? Do you have the time to go out and become an expert on nuclear submarines or on supersonic planes if you're spending all your time on the phone with would-be donors? That is, I don't, there's no question that that is a problem. Uh, one of the criticisms of Yates and as we're talking, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, Tribune columnist. He uh, called Yates the flyover congressman because he didn't think Yates came back often enough. And frankly, I didn't think he did either. I would talk to our chief of staff, can't you get him back, get him back? And she'd say, well, honey, uh, this weekend he's going to the Kennedy Center with, with Regula and his wife, and he's doing this. One of the things I learned uh, 
in doing the research for the, the book. Yes. Yates was doing his job. He was staying there, he was meeting, he was socializing with everybody. Um, and fundraising is it, it's just simply so damn time consuming. I don't know a single member who enjoys getting on the phone and begging for money. Um, some of you may remember Ab Mikva. He had some rather legendary races in the uh, three terms in the 70s. And it, he, he was telling a group of us once that the one thing he really disliked was the constant fundraising. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. I mean, there's a solution, but we'll never, I don't think we're going to see. Except that, 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 that said, though, I, I think members of the House particularly can become experts. First, first they, they, have to, they have to care about being in the House as, as, a, um, uh, as a career, as an institution, not as a, not as a, uh, a stopping point when they, while they're going to go run, run for something else. Um, Mem members of the House have the, have the opportunities. They, they have incredible resources. They have the, the, the staff of the Library of Congress, which will bring them anything and will send them an expert. Um, we found that um, there, is, there is nobody who won't talk to a member of Congress. Uh, I remember uh, uh, meeting with Paul si the, uh, Senator Paul Simon before he, he died, and, and he used to talk about how uh, one of the great things about being both in Congress and in the Senate, he said it was, it was, it was you, were, you were like the, um, the, the three-headed pony in the circus. If you call somebody up, they would always want to come and see you. And Yates, Yates did that. I mean, he, he, um, we, got, we, got, we got involved one time during um, one of the um, uh, ener energy crises, and there was a, uh, uh, an article, an op-ed article in the Washington Post about how Mexico was this incredible source of oil, which had, which had been untapped. Um, he called up this, the scientist who had written this op-ed and said, uh, uh, will, will you come out to Washington and talk to me about this because I'm on the uh, uh, Energy Appropriations uh, sub Subcommittee and, I, and I'd like to know it. And they come out. There's, there's, if, if, if you want to do it, you can become an expert in an issue, even with the time constraints that you've got today because of fundraising. Hi, your comment about Congressman Yates being called the flyover congressman kind of to me relates back to the comment about today's Congress being Tuesday <coughs> to Thursday. Um, my own congressman is Mike Quigley and he does sleep in his office. Uh, he's one of the guys who does. But I guess I, what I'm wondering is given back in Congressman Yates' day, it seems to me that a lot of there's a lot of pressure now on Congress members of Congress to be seen in their districts on the weekends or whenever going to the festivals and the bingos and the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, so I guess your, your comment about him being known as the flyover congressman because he wasn't seen in the district a lot kind of to me relates to that. And I mean, given that kind of change in how people see the perceptions, can you see that changing at all? Well, and I think one of the reasons members come back as much as they do, because many of them are in safe districts. So the first question you ask yourself is, why? Can't would, hear you. Oh, why? Can you hear me? Yeah. Why would somebody in a safe district keep coming back? Coming back. It's all the primary. Fend off anybody who thinks they might run against you, and you—you, you, it, it's instinctive. I think you come back to be seen, to be with people, um, and avoid a primary. You—you uh, you do sometimes. You wind up getting primary, but uh, most members in safe districts—that's the one thing they want to avoid. And, and obviously there has there has to be a balance between it. But but if if a a, a congress 
a congressperson has first good constituent services because there's, <laughs> you you will get more votes by some by having helped somebody with with, with a problem than 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 almost almost any anything else. Uh, second, I, I think that the technology is such these days that. Um, there are so many opportunities to interact with constituents with, with, without having to go back every, every, every week. That I, I think there are still ways to, ways to do it. And, and uh, I think as George said, I think people are so afraid of, of being primaried either on the left or on the right that they're, they're not willing to, I think, trust some of their constituents. Okay, well, Greg, how about you? So, what was Yates's role in this? Did he review the book? Obviously, you know him well and you work with him. So what was his role? And then two, are there things in the book that he would have preferred not to be in the book? Well, first, you know, he, he, he died in 2000, so he was, um, he was, he was long gone by before this, this book came out. We, we, we did have extensive conversations with um, uh, his, his sister-in-law, uh, his uh, his daughter his daughter in law who is still alive who gave us a lot of the f of of the family stories, um, I think he would be upset by some of the book. Um, Mary Bain, who his chief of staff, who uh, gave us hours and hours of of mostly off the record interviews, uh, was the most protective person of him that that, that that there could be, and would would never allow a bad word to to be said about him. Um, we we interviewed her literally, and I hate to say literally because it's so it's so overused. But we, we we interviewed her in the uh, uh, over the years, but in the weeks before she died, um, we had inter interviews with her in uh, in Washington D.C. where where she she couldn't sit up anymore, so she was uh, laying on her bed, and we were we were talking to her, and a, a lot of the stories that we had been trying to find out for years that nobody in, in the Yates office would tell us uh, did come out. Um, the Yates that we talked about, we, um, I, I like him more as, as a result of the research I did than, than, than I did when I worked for him more. I respected him tremendously, but I learned to like him now because he was much, much, much more of a person. Uh, but he could be just an arrogant son of a bitch. We, 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 we have, we have a, uh, a, a story in there where he held up the entire Congress because uh, he wanted to get his way. And um, in, in the Senate, they were saying there is one man who is holding up this important program, and, and, and it's Sidney Yates out over in the House. He, he ignored, um, he was in a conference committee, and he ignored uh, the House issuing a con an instruction to the conferees saying you have got to vote this way. And he said, um, I don't care. Uh, this is not what I believe in. I'm going to do what I believe. Um, I, I don't think he would want the arrogance showing up as much. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he would want some of the pettiness uh, showing up as much. Uh, but to us, I think he, uh, he just rose in our, our admiration. Should we go to Dick's question? So, um, in our interviews and in the book, we talk, we talk about the sort of unspoken deal with Mayor Daley that Sid could be a liberal and do whatever he wanted in Washington as long as he didn't mess with Chicago politics. For, so, for instance, he wouldn't endorse people like Bill Singer running for all women in Chicago. Um, and there are lots of other examples like that over the decades. So what do you make of that, what should we call it, a compromise, an agreement? A, a, I don't think anyone's ever produced a, you know, a memo from a meeting or uh, actually unearthed an actual agreement signed in blood or any other way. But it's pretty clear that's what happened. And it obviously stems from the defeat in 46 when he ran and was defeated by the machine. 39. But for the, but for, yeah. for the 46th yeah. Ward, that's where the 46th Ward. <laughs> uh, so maybe I, you can explain that to the audience. And then I think uh, Yates did have a, an unspoken, as far as, certainly as far as we know, it was unspoken agreement that he would stay out of Ward business and uh, Mayor Daley would leave Yates alone, let him do whatever he wanted in Washington. And he, 
I think as he was getting involved in politics, and he suffered a defeat when he ran for alderman of the 46th Ward in 39, uh, and he lost, uh, he came in a distant third. Uh, I think he kind of then thought, if I'm going to be a success, I'm going to have to make an unwritten deal. It could sometimes kind of backfire on you. Uh, the, he got into an argument with uh, the committeeman of the 43rd Ward. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. First name was Danny. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, he was on, I think he was on the county board at one time. And as best we could tell, Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan, thank you. Uh, O'Brien wanted Yates to intervene with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to help with a project in which O'Brien was an investor. Um, and Yates refused. Uh, I, it, it, we had a meeting in his office. O'Brien came in and said, I need you to help. Yates said, no, uh, can't do it. So there was a little bit of antagonism, and then uh, the local state senator held a lunch between O'Brien and Yates, hoping to smooth it all over. And O'Brien says to Yates, if you don't help, we're going to run a candidate against you in the primary. And Yates said to uh, O'Brien, well, he had a good career but I'm not compromising on this. I'm not going to do it. Run somebody if you want, which O'Brien, in fact, did. Um, I had learned from a precinct captain that two of the board committee, uh, Ralph Axelrod and Marty Tucho, were in an unspoken alliance with, with O'Brien, and they were working in the precincts against Yates. So I brought it to Yates' attention, and he said, no, no, no. I mean, they wouldn't, Marty and Ralph would never turn on me. Um, Danny Rostenkowski called Yates one day and said, I just came from a meeting of the Cook County Democratic Organization. Sid, watch your back. And <laughs> Yates said, uh, my back's fine. My golf game is uh, it's really good. And he goes, no, 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 Sid, watch your political back. There are a couple of guys you, you better watch. You can't trust them. So uh, Yates got off the phone and said, I told you I couldn't trust those two guys. Where's Mary? Get Mary on the line. She was our chief of staff and political strategist. Uh, but you know, it was that kind of relationship. Uh, and, and the progressives never forgave uh, Mr. Yates for supporting Daly over Bill Singer that, that in, in that election. Well, it wasn't only that. They supported uh, the Ward Committeeman Alderman Mannequin against Bill Singer when he ran for Alderman. Mm -hmm. And it's also the same thing. Barack Obama made the same deal with Richard Mendel. Uh So what do you make of this? let's call it a compromise, necessary to get things done or get to higher office. Fred? Go ahead. No, Paul Douglas, uh, in his memoirs, talks about Daly and how much he admired Daly. And Daly never asked him to do anything that he, Douglas, considered unethical. I think that's, that's part of politics. Uh, it's not always easy to make those kinds of compromises, but if you can do something for your district in Washington, then you need sometimes need to do it. Maybe we could switch a little bit to uh, writing from politics. This is a big job. Uh, what advice do you have for the authors in the room if they're going to undertake a book like this 
to uh, pull it all together and make it work. Well, there were there were a few things. One one is it's 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 really wonderful how how much is available online now. Um, we, uh, we 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 both. Um, because we, we are, we're affiliated with, with different uh, universities. Uh, one of the great things is just having access to the, um, the, the, the university share, shared book system where we could order almost anything. Uh, we were also able to get on the, the, the databases that these universities had, had subscriptions to, which made things much, much easier. Um, but the, the interviews were essential. We started doing interviews uh, B b before Mr. Yates died, when we were just thinking about doing something um, in the years after he had died uh, and before Mary Bain died, we did more. We did more interviews. Um, one of the wonderful things about this book is is that we could we could call almost almost anyone. We we were able to call, uh, we we flew out to to Idaho to talk to Cecil Andrus, who had been the secretary of the had been governor of Idaho, but had been secretary of the Interior when. Uh, when Ms. Yates was chairman of that appropriations uh, subcommittee, we talked to former White House staffers from the, from the, the, the Carter administration, Ford administration. Um, we uh, our, our very last interview, when when the University of Illinois Press was saying you got to finish the manuscript, you got a due date, is uh, we called Nancy Pelosi and and said you know will you, will you will you talk to us about Sid Yates? We had to we had to get through. A couple of, of people to get to her, but as soon as we got to her, she said, "Yeah, come on out to Washington," because she had, uh, when she was a fresh a freshman and just had come to Congress, uh, Yates and, and Mary Bain had had had, ment had mentored her in, in the ways of the House, and that that made it very special. But uh, I said, you know, "Do the interviews, see what's what's available," and and certainly our presidential libraries are just a tremendous resource. And and again, being affiliated with the University with the School of the Art Institute, Oakton Community College was a great thing for us. Uh, in our next project, I'm not sure what it's going to be yet, but <laughs> I will be much more organized. Um, I, I would go and I would, we would know the chapters and I'd have all of the research and I'd go over to the library. I hate writing. I just. Once I start, I'm fine, but getting myself to sit down. But then once the chapter was written and we would exchange chapters and make comments and uh, edits and things like that, then I would just take the stuff and put it in a big plastic bin. And at the very end, uh, we had a copywriter and it drove me berserk trying to go back and retrieve a lot of the stuff. And Michael is being very kind uh, when he's talking about the technology. I am not a very technologically proficient person. And the copy editor caught a few, I think it was maybe seven or eight URLs that I had missed a digit or something. And I think it's the only time I actually found Mike come close to losing his temper with me. We were in his <laughs> office and I kept saying, I know I got the, this URL right and Mike says, couldn't you please just find the document? It's right at the top of the document. Um, so I'd be much more attentive to that. And, and then purely just from a writing standpoint, one of the, one of the very best things we did is, uh, and this is part of, of a collaboration process, is we, we read the chapters out loud, and it, it was amazing to us when you read the chapter out loud how many times one has repeated a word. Uh, and, and so we, we would be able to, to get, get rid of that, and, and we were able to, to try to get to, to make sure we had one voice in, in the book, even though each of us had taken point on different chapters. Well, and that was one of the suggestions Dick had uh, he said, read the book. One person read it, the other one sit there. And so Mike would sit on one side of the table with his laptop, and I would read it. And it is, it's true. I discovered there are certain words I use uh, little, little too much, literally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for coming. This has been a great program. I want to wave this.
fly around and hope you'll grab one for our next program, uh, which will be at the Harold Washington Library Center in January. And everybody here is welcome. Uh, just like tonight's program, they're all very interesting, and I hope you can make that. Thank you for coming through the cold tonight, <laughs> and I hope you all make it home warmly and safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it.